good afternoon friends uh, respected vice chancellor and uh, our today's distinguished serious speaker professor nigam prasad rath our director uh, ccs culture and uh, all the faculty members deans and uh, students so very warm good afternoon everyone so today we have assembled here to hear the distinguished lecture series by professor nigam prasad rath so you all agree with me that the uh, on november 18 19 sorry 1895 so german physics professor wilhelm ronjen so he found out the uh, different type of ray he named it as x ray so it uh, it was in 1895 but still so the application of this x ray still we are uh, visibly we are using it so it has a long history then so as students know some of the inventions in dk and uh, no applications whereas this x ray still has lot of applications and uh, that is why you can see during the pandemic also so we could able to see how our lungs were affected using this x ray only so still it is a separate branch in uh, medical field uh, radiation this is very hot field still so this is about the physics invention all those things you may wonder so what is the role in chemistry so today uh, we have a distinguished professor he is going to talk about the chemical crystallography in uh, research and teaching so you must be we have hosted this you must be knowing about the uh, the uh, bio of professor nigam prasad rat so it is my honest duty uh, honor duty to uh, introduce our uh, distinguished professor he studied the bsc honors in uh, the brahampur university brahampur and msc also from same university then uh, phd in uh, oklahoma state university still water then he was the research professor in department of chemistry biochemistry university of missouri and uh, he was also post doctoral associate before that in university of notre dame and uh, he was basically junior research fellow initially before he moved to uh, es in uh, department of chemistry iit iit kanpur so he has uh, more than uh, uh, if i am not wrong because i could able to trace it is only up to 2011 so it was more than uh, 600 publication am i correct sir so more than 600 600 publications so then you can see the uh, wide variety of research he has done so he is a visiting sci- scientist in different universities he has got he has got national merit scholarship india in 1977 79 and then uh, as you know the junior jr of fellowship also csir jr of fellowship so he has got american chemical society travel award for students in 1985 itself then service of a- award then distinguished service award from university of missouri and he is a member of american crystallography association so with this uh, i now i uh, invite our uh, honorable vice chancellor to speak about uh, the speaker and also the importance of this uh, lecture series yes professor well uh, good afternoon friends professor rat our friend professor tarani and professor jain all other faculty members sitting here and uh, all the students who are here having so many students is a very encouraging sign and i was uh, thinking of talking about a bit on crystallography the lecture is going to be on that but then seeing so many students and i think this is the first chemistry talk uh, i'll say talk on science because i have seen uh, i'm seeing earth science experts physics is there maths is there people from 
variety of subjects are there now. And crystallography is going to be useful for all these subjects. Everybody uses it. I'll talk very briefly about it a little later. But for the benefit of students who are here, you know, there are two kinds who will study chemistry. One will take up chemistry in the school, and after that, couple of lectures here and there, and couple of uh, discourses from their parents about chemistry, they do away with it. And after that, they always remember chemistry is one we never picked up, we never liked, we never understood. That's one lot of it. Second is, who take up this and go on to work in the right uh, direction in a right manner, and then land up at all the places. But let me tell you, it's a wonderful subject. You cannot have anything without chemistry. I will challenge anyone. And I have done my own uh, research on Indian cinema. You would have seen all the movies right from 46 onwards, when we had the first uh, Devika Rani's movies and onwards. There are two things without which you will not be able to find a single film. If anybody finds you come to me, I will probably undergo any punishment. One, without God, somewhere in some form or the other, maybe in songs or somewhere, God will be there. And other is rail gadi, train. Either of the two, they have to be there in an Indian cinema. Similarly, without chemistry, you tell me anything, I will uh, give you any award. Name anything, chair, automobile, petrol, your dresses, specs, surgery, modern warfare, chemistry is always there. Therefore, people treat chemistry as a very boring subject, but it's a very interesting subject. It's the way you look at it. So, I think I'll, I'll talk about the lighter side of it with the permission of the speaker, because this has nothing to do with crystallography, but it has everything to do with chemistry. You know, people will say, why is it that chemists live for a very long time? They never die. That's the way, you know, you look at, if I give you my own department's data, there are people who have lived on for well past 90, they are still living. They make their own food. They never die reason. They only become unreactive, that's all, non-reactive. They never die. That's the reason for their long life. Why chemists are so successful administrators? Now also, if you take the data of Indian vice chancellors in 54 central universities, the largest number is of chemistry background. When I was a student, largest number of vice chancellors, successful vice chancellors, were all from chemistry. To name a few, Professor Mehrotra was one who worked in organometallics. Professor Gurbak Singh was one who used to be a synthetic organic chemist. So many others, I will, uh, it will be wrong on my part to name a few, but then many. They were all chemists. Why are they so successful? I don't count myself as a successful vice chancellor, though I am also a chemist. But why are they so successful? They have a knack for solving problems. They solve problems. We all do it. Why are they able to solve problems? Because they always have solutions with them. Always. They always have solutions. That's why they're able to sort out. And let me tell you, some of the successful politicians have been all very successful chemists. Margaret Thatcher, you all know. You know, she earned so much of money out of a discovery that she made while working on inorganic polymers in a lab. She was never inclined for politics. She developed that ice cream, ice cream scoops. It was her discovery. So much money she earned, then she realized, look, here there is no power, no respect, because some cop challenged her, and uh, despite her request, he said, no, I am the authority, you have to pay. That point onwards, she decided, I am going to have authority. And she went on to become Prime Minister of UK, very successful Prime Minister, chemistry background. K.C. Pant, you would have heard, very successful finance committee chairman of our country. He was an inorganic chemist, incidentally. Many others, let me again, not you, I will leave it to you for the youngsters and exercise how many chemists, four United States presidents have been chemists. So I, I was giving a reason that they always have a solution. You say optimistic, the psychologist will tell an optimistic gentleman is one who will always say this glass is half full.
the pessimist will say it is half empty we are chemists we are great people we will say it is completely full it is completely full half is water half is air we will never say that it is half full pessimistic optimistic we are always on that side so this is uh, these are some of the interesting things there was a fellow who was not able to be cured so doctors were all busy they said they are doing helium they are heal healing him helium if you can't heal him you can't cure him cure him is another <laughs> element and if you can't cure him you bury him <laughs> so that is the beauty of chemistry it's a way you teach i have not uh, talked about some of the boring things what is the dullest element uh, out of all the elements borium <laughs> bor neil bors you have heard about so that's uh, borium they said uh, you know for toddlers when i go to the schools i tell them once oxygen went for a picnic with uh, potassium what happened oh it was okay you know o n k so it's a uh, it's a way you look at the subject it's a way you teach a subject so chemistry is uh, i can go on and on let me tell you so i was thinking i'll not uh, eat on to professor rath's time now my my common interest with professor rath let me tell you is that uh, our uh, three years of common research three and a half years to be a little more precise i was there i lectured there i stayed with him we had very good time in st louis Three and a half years that we collaborated. If you look at his publications, which are about 600 plus, more than 15. I started counting yesterday when I was going through his CV. I counted 10, and the number was going on. I said, "No, let's not count." My guess was about 15 plus are our joint publications on crystallography. And uh, you know, there is a there is an area these days. It's called uh, uh, interventionist cardiologist. and this the biggest money spenders in united states are this these people interventionist cardiologists they will look at it and you need a need a stunt they will do it through the arm these days very quickly it is done takes about 25 minutes so a doctor with this kind of a specialty would have about 3 4 surgeries done every day and they get enormous money out of it so they are called money minting machines they are not called human beings in united states they'll just come with closed eyes they will keep doing it next next that kind of a thing so same goes for professor rat anybody goes to him and obviously crystallography i'll talk about it what is the importance of this so he will do the crystallography crystallography doing is not a problem i mean i can do it but to interpret is an exercise which uh, uh, eats your uh, not only brain eats everything even your family life at times is eaten because you are so disturbed what is it so professor rath is a specialist he would do the crystallography not only that he will interpret also and people from all range of subjects would come and they would uh, come to him even if he has not done it for interpretation and uh, somehow people say how oh, shukuntala devi was able to shukuntala devi was able to give you an answer like computer somebody said he she had a chip put into her mind and she would be able to give you so probably he has a chip in his mind that any crystallographic pattern that comes to him he is able to analyze and comes up with a structure and that is one of the reasons that could he could come out with about 600 plus publications in uh, whatever span of career that he is there and he is not given up he is still on there is a fellow called jagdishan in our uh, indian indian chemical technology lab he's done lot of work but his primary work is to maintain nmrs he has seven nmrs and none of the nmrs has stopped even for a day 700 megahertz also is there he is doing very well people were saying no his fundamental research is zero i said no running seven nmrs is the greatest contribution you can think of this is equivalent to one full professorship so i was the one who supported i said no and he is now on a scientist g level probably he would have super invented professor rath that way has about 7 8 xrds in his department and you will find him running he'll run this one pattern he'll be in the second lab second moment third lab is somewhere 
when I gave a long talk in my area, which was attended by all faculty members that day, surprisingly, uh, there also he ran and looked at the patterns. So this is the way he has been managing that at St. Louis, so very wonderfully well. Such a kind of a subject expert is rare to find. And he does it with a smiling face. Anybody who sends, he will say it will be done. Never says no. That is the hallmark of a good chemist and a good person, good human being. That is where Professor Rath is. He is one among us, done very well in the United States. Since he was here, he wrote that he is likely to be here. I said, my program is a little uncertain because Prime Minister is likely to visit. But you schedule your visit, we will see how best to say. But probably, when he fixed it, Prime Minister decided to change his program. So, that's how he is here with us for today, tomorrow, day after he will be leaving. So, he decided to speak on this crystallography, which youngsters may not find it very interesting. I have been teaching all along my teaching career two very difficult topics, group theory and inorganic reaction mechanism. Organic reaction mechanism is very easy, let me tell you. There are many who are sitting here. But inorganic reaction mechanics is as bad as crystallography is. So I've been doing it, but very enjoyable. It becomes very enjoyable once you understand what is it about. Then it is enjoyable. And for that, you need to get into this. So look at, listen to his talk, uh, and then decide you will find that it is an area to move into. We have an XRD in our university as well. It's an area to move into. It's like anybody, no doctor will be able to give you any diagnosis unless he looks at the ECG or uh, some other patterns. Same goes for XRD, I mean crystallography. Unless you have a pattern, you will not be able to be certain about the structure. And that's what Professor Rath is doing. I will not uh, dwell more on this and would invite him for this talk. Maybe a little more uh, uh, tidbits. If you get too disturbed by his uh, hardcore talk, which it's not difficult, let me tell you, you will enjoy. But a little more on that, maybe towards the end, when vote of thanks is going to be proposed. So that's about it. Please enjoy his talk and extend a very warm welcome to him. Good afternoon, everybody. It's such an honor to stand here and the invitation from Vice Chancellor that I hope I can at least meet to some extent of that introduction that Vice Chancellor gave. I'm not much of a chemist anymore. I haven't wetted my hands probably for 30 plus years. So I'll leave all the chemistry stuff to the chemistry professors here. And it is my great pleasure to actually visit this department. It is a very strong department, and I was really impressed with the facilities, with the students, um, you know, all the research and teaching that being done in this department. And that's why, so it was a big question what I should present. And I asked Professor Singh, Vice Chancellor, that what should I present? He said, make it an overall, okay? So now I'll see how overall I was able to make, and hopefully I will not bore you to death with just data. So <clears throat> let's first, so here is a uh, outline of the presentation. So we'll talk about what's chemical crystallography. I mean, as Professor Singh indicated, so crystallography is a extremely, you know, inter, uh, um, very, it, it crosses the lines of physics, chemistry, mathematics, and uh, medicine, biology. There are about 28 Nobel Prizes so far awarded in crystallography, the most in any single particular field. So, but that's a very broad field that we are talking. That's why I made sure I make it clear that what we are talking is the chemical crystallography, that is the application of crystallography to chemistry side of it. I'm not doing anything with development of theory. I'm not doing anything with diffraction theories. I'm not developing software, but I'm using everybody else's techniques and information to interpret the data about chemistry, about molecules, and we'll see why and how. <clears throat> then we'll talk about advances in chemical crystallography or molecular crystallography, which has made it such an easy, accessible technique now. I mean, we'll talk about what it was and how far have we come. 
Um, we'll talk about some of the few interesting examples of structure solution and refinement, but I will not try to dwell on it. That's the boring part of crystallography, and that's not something anybody wants to see. Everybody wants to see a good structure and what that means. How it, we got there, we'll not too much worry about it. And that part is the boring part, I have to tell you. And for 30 plus years, I've been involved in teaching of crystallography. Under the auspices of American Crystallography Association and International Union, Union of Crystallography, we were the first ones to introduce teaching crystallography and including crystallography in undergraduate labs. Typically, crystallography is taught in the graduate course or what we would call PhD level courses. We thought it's time to bring it to the starting point, and not simply make it something of a very lofty thing. And I mean, there, there are some personal experience with this. When I came to University of Missouri St. Louis, one of the curator's professors or endowed professors was Professor Bob Murray. And I was introducing myself to all the senior professors. And he said, Nigam, I'm glad you are here. But trust me, I'll never use your facility. I said, why? He said, I'm a strong, hardcore organic chemist. If I cannot solve any other way, I'll think about crystallography. So it happened, and a year later, he had this bromine compound that was very difficult to get the three-dimensional structure by multidimensional NMR. So he came to me and said, here is a challenge. I have told my postdoc to run 2D, MN, 2D NMR, and he will give his interpretation. And I will give you this crystal. If you give me the structure before him, and this was an absolute structure determination. So I said, OK, I'll up for the challenge. And what happened is, what I didn't tell him at that point, it has a bromine in it. It's very easy to do the absolute structure when you have a heavy atom such as bromine. So it made my life very easy. It was a good crystal. So I won the challenge. Before his postdoc could get the 2D NMR interpreted, I gave him the structure. From there on, he was one of my best um, scientists to you know, join the crystallography. He even gave a full talk in American Chemical Society Association meeting because he was so much, so much you know, he liked the field so much. So, say, so in teaching crystallography, so there were different layers. So that's why I thought it's time to not just limit it, this lofty thing. Most of the times we thought of crystallography as either a very unreachable field or a, the last resort, we don't want to go there. If everything else fails, and I'm going to just you know, sit down and do this thing, but not very happily. That was the stat status of crystallography. So now in the last 20 years or so, we have taught crystallography in the undergraduate labs and the undergraduate theory. And I'll give you a couple of experiments that we have done and my experience with it. And this was a, so there was a full symposium by American Chemical Society that I chaired in 2011, where we invited many different faculty from different colleges to see what they would think about these experiments that we have designed. And we were lucky that a lot of departments did decide to implement those experiments. So let's first talk about advances in molecular crystallography. So, how far have we come in and where we are going? So this is where kind of reminiscing for the last 20 years of things. Crystallography has taken a huge leap in the last 20 years, and there are specific reasons for that. And that would be primarily, so there are hardware. So just to give you an example, the graduate school, when I was a PhD student, if I can do one structure in two to three weeks, that's a big successful two, three weeks. Because the instrument, was lim instrument time was limited, then instrument capability, capabilities were limited, and we really needed crystals of the size of what you are wearing on your rings. Okay? Pretty large single crystals we needed to do that. Time had changed a lot. Now, from, you know, sometimes I've done crystal structures of 10 to 15 micron size crystals. That a lot of these you won't be able to even see. Even under microscope, we just pick something, hope it's there, and do the structure. So that, that's a huge difference in terms of capability in the hardware wise. 
and we are not going to go in too far details into it. So there are the primary difference is the detector technology. About 30 years back, the detectors that we used to, so maybe I should go to the next slide and we'll talk about it. So basically crystallography means we are taking picture of a molecule. It's a three dimensional picture. How we can do that? Just like you are sitting there, there are chairs, we can take a camera and take a picture because we have the right wavelength of light, we have a source, and we have a detector, which is your camera, to capture the light that's being reflected. And same thing, so obviously, you, I, table, chair, everything is made of molecules. So they are three-dimensional space things. It's just they are tiny. So if we can find the right camera, the right light source, then we are done. We can take pictures of anything we want, you know, picture of molecules. So that's where <clears throat> there has been significant improvement. So the source is one thing that right now we are souping up the source. We can get much brighter sources. That is the light source. At the same time, we have also the detector side. So on the detector side, we used to be limited by using what are called point detectors or serial detectors. And these can scan a peak and find the maxima and go on and find the next one. So just to give you an analogy or you know, kind of a uh, silly way of looking at it is, so today you need to buy X, Y, and Z, potatoes, onion, you know, or chowl, and whatever else. So you can make a list. You can go to the grocery store and pick those up. That's one way of doing shopping. And that's what we used to do with a point detector system. That is, we used to find the lattice, again, I'm kind of jumping out of myself. I haven't decided, I haven't told you what a lattice is. But whatever that thing is, we need to find that. We need to define where we expect these peaks and go and sit there and find those peaks. So it's a kind of very time consuming, very slow process. So scientists, not me, there are physicists who are doing detector development. They decided, let's do something else. Instead of making a list, going to the store, buying these pieces one by one, let's go to the Reliance store, buy the Reliance store, bring it home, then pick out what we need, what we don't need, let's just dump it. We don't worry about it. So that made it faster, right? So now I have all the information I need, whether I need it or not, all in one place. Now I can simply pick and choose. So even if I made a mistake in my list, I'm not losing the information. I just have to change the information. Instead of going to the third cell and pick up the rice, maybe I have to go to the left side of the cell and pick up the dog. But it's all there, because I have purchased the whole Reliance store now. Right? So that, that's, that's how the system has changed. So the thing that used to take me two weeks of data collection, with the new systems we have, I can probably collect data in an hour or two. So that's the advancement in the hardware side. Software. Software development is very important, particularly for these type of, because think about the amount of calculation that we need to do to get the structure. So just to give you an example, if we have 10 atoms in a molecule, we are talking about 90 parameters that we are going to refine. That means we are playing with a 90 by 90 matrix and we are manipulating that 90 by 90 matrix to do, sorry, to do a three-dimensional regression analysis or least squares analysis. So to be able to do that, the computers must be fast enough. And when I started my career, the biggest computer, what we used to have, now you are, you know, the watch you have has much more memory and much more cap capacity than the university's entire university's computing system. When I came to University of Missouri St. Louis, we have VAC systems. And the entire university system had a total storage of two gigabytes. Two gigabytes. Mind that. Now probably your laptop has two terabytes of memory, I mean two storage, right? And the computer, entire computer has two megabytes of RAM. I don't think you can even buy a two megabyte RAM chip anymore. 
we, we had a conference in uh, Philadelphia where we had invited all the living Nobel laureates at that time. In, I think it was in 90, 1990. And one of the Nobel laureates said, he was, he was from Cambridge University. First computer came to Cambridge University with 112K of RAM. And at that time, they went out to the bar that night and decided to just drink because they couldn't think how much, how they can access this kind of memory and make use of it. It was way overwhelming power to be able to just use it. So now the computer chips you buy, I don't, as I said, I don't think you can even buy a chip with two megabytes of RAM memory anymore. So those, those are, but so for software, not, not only just the software needs to be fast enough, but the computer processing it must, have, must also be doing that fast enough. So one of the ways we solve structures is what's called brute force method, when nothing else works. Just let it crunch number and randomly start plugging structures, see what sticks. And for that to run, you need a full-fledged supercomputer to be able to do this calculation over and over and over millions of times and you just go in once in a while, check the results, and see if anything looks feasible or reasonable, pick that one and see if it works until you get that. But I'm still going to tell you there are probably few structures I haven't cracked yet. But those are becoming very easy and accessible now. So we already talked about computing power. That enables us to refine structure in a relatively short time. And that's very important, particularly for the teaching side of crystallography. Because if we would have to sit four hours to see a structure solution, definitely we can't use that in a lab setting. You have only a lab period of three or four hours. We can't simply waste and hope it worked, right? So that's where the, right now, you hit the enter button probably in the next two seconds, either could be a wrong solution, but you have a solution that you can try. So that's where we are. We have come that far in the last 20 years. And the next slide will show how the number of structures that we have been producing has gone up in, in the next. So what's our next steps? Where are we going from here? We have already developed enough in computing power. We have de developed enough in terms of source. We have developed pretty good in terms of detect detectors. So where are we going now? We still need more higher and more higher resolution uh, detectors to be able to access the crystals that we still can't do. Our limit is still the size of the crystal because the amount of crystal that goes into the beam is the amount that we will get the scattering from. So tinier the crystal, lesser scattering, that means we have to get more and more bigger and bigger detectors, more and more sensitive detectors to be able to capture that data. And not only that, on the source side, we can't just use a fixed source. We have to go to rotating anodes. We have to go to synchrotron sources, where you know, in a synchrotron source, if by mistake you left something, it's just going to vaporize you. That much intensity of the beam is inside the chamber there. So um, at, the, at the moment, the best we can do in home labs, in my lab or in the lab here at in, um, Pondicherry University, Pondicherry University if we can go up to microfocus sources. So microfocus sources are specifically meant to handle small crystal. So instead of a beam of about a millimeter or half a millimeter size, let's focus all that power into maybe 20 micron size. So all that intensity is now very much targeted to one very single spot, which is good enough for because that still has plenty of number of molecules to get the structure. So that's a microfocus source. And there are metal jet sources and other more advanced ones coming, very, very expensive, of course, as you go along, higher and higher. And of course, the national labs, and I'm sure there are synchrotron sources in India too. So there are national labs where you can have synchrotron sources where the electrons are being energized in big rings, and then you pull it out using magnets, and you can tune the radiation, uh, the angstrom or the wavelength of the radiation to be able to suit, suit to what you are, whatever you are doing. So those are extremely powerful beams. So that's the next step. And same way, we still need to de develop better software, particularly visualization software, docking software, 
These are because one of the things that crystallography is good with is the visualization. Unless human beings are meant to be visual, and one of the reasons crystallography is so easy to grasp is because we get a three-dimensional picture. So visualization is very important. And that's not just the fun part or the playing part of it. It's also important for the scientific side of it. So think about the, you know, developing a drug. There are many, many, many groups involved in it, okay? Let's say HIV virus or the coronavirus. All, of, all the viruses can be crystallized. And we have structure of HIV virus. We have structure of proteins. We, can stru we have structure of enzymes. So let's say coronavirus, that was determined one of the fastest structure that was determined in about three months. And so we know the now the shape. So why it is important? Why a structure is important? Because if we don't know the shape and size of the molecules, we can't make any use of it, right? We know how the water looks. That's why we can know where it will react, where it will not react. And any chemical, any new synthetic product that we get, we need to know the three-dimensional structure so we can figure out what we can make it up, what we can make it used for. So same way, so let's say we know the structure of the virus. Now, there are the computational chemists who will come in and say, okay, to be able to give this virus something that it will like better than the human cell, this is what the molecule should look like. There must be a OH group here. There should be this much distance. There should be a NH2 group there. There must be something else at that point. There should be a double bond here. And more and more. So this is what the shape and size of the molecule they need. Okay. Then it goes to synthetic chemist. They will come up with the synthesis. They will make that molecule. Unfortunately, nature is very rarely cooperative. So they had set everything right. It's not that the synthetic chemist made a mistake, but nature has its own ideas. So maybe it was lucky they got the first chance, but probably not. So that molecule which came up, now we have to somehow figure out what is the structure of that. Is it going to really lock this virus? Do we have the ammonia, ammonium group here where it should have been? Is it the OH group here? Is that distance still you know, 3.5 units or whatever that's supposed to have been. That's where I come in. That's where, if, if it can be crystallized, I can do a structure and tell you, give you the picture in three-dimensional space. This is how the molecule looks like. So that's where we need more and more better software, quicker software, more, you know, capable software, and that's what we are going to, we are, that's where we are going. So now it has become a routine at least I feel that crystallography has become a routine technique that it should be introduced at every level to be able to be used and you need to be trained. You are the tomorrow's chemist, you are the tomorrow's scientist. So here is a slide from Cambridge Structural Database. Any organic compound, any organometallic compound, that is anything that has a carbon, a structure is determined. It's, it's deposited what's called Cambridge Crystallography Database. So you can see the number of structures de deposited since 1972. So 1972, oh, looks like about maybe 100 structures, entire world. So it kept going. You will see right around 95, 94, 96, it's starting, starting to take off. That's where the detector technology changed. That's where we stopped making lists and buying out the store. So that's why there was a rapid growth in number of structures that can be determined. And this is only for small molecules. But same thing true for proteins, for virus, for all the macromolecules that's being done. Probably not in the same rate of, you know, rate as we see for small molecules. Definitely we don't have a million uh, protein structures or virus structures in the database. But that's the rate at which it's going up. So, <clears throat> and thanks to the development of modern detectors and software, we are able to do that now. So here is a kind of um, a way of showing you what we do in a comparative way. So on the left side, we are showing a visual microscopy. All of you have used microscopes. What do we do? We want to see something in a larger size. How, do, how is that, that happening? So we have the object there. So it's a tiny something and we have light falling on it. So light reflects, 
Then we have the objective lens system, which refocuses the light. And on the other end, you have the detector, which is your eye. So eye looks at that same thing in a much larger size. We can do the same thing in, for the molecules. So that means we need to have some kind of light source. And the crystal is sitting there, which is the object there. And we can illuminate with x-rays. And now we can use a detector to be able to see. So if that's the case, why am I getting paid? Anybody can look, at, you know, look into the x-ray microscope and see the structure. Well, there's a little problem. And it, without going into too much details, what's called a phase problem. In the <coughs> visible light system, the, <coughs> the lens system, sorry, the lens system retains all the information that's being scattered. So there are two parts to this. There is the phase information, and then there is the intensity information. So both of those are still retained. So we can simply combine. So, but unfortunately, there are no material which has high enough refractive capability to be able to recombine x-rays. So that's where you need that crystallographer. And you pay big money to be able to do that, to finish that. So half of the information is lost. It's not truly lost, but it cannot be recorded in the way that we record x-rays. So that's where all the computing, all the calculation things come in. And we'll look at why it is important that we have crystal. That should be next. So once we have solved that problem, once we have find out the phase information, then it's simple. Just like there we are doing a, um, a different Fourier synthesis, uh, Fourier synthesis, I does that for us. And we do that, and that combines and forms the bigger picture. We can do a Fourier synthesis here, and we get the big, complete picture. So X-ray diffraction and crystal. So what is, what is X-ray diffraction? X-ray diffraction is a diffracted beam that is simply a large number of, so anything X-ray hits, X-ray scatters, just like any visible light, okay? So when a certain condition, what's called Bragg's law is satisfied, these scattered waves actually can reinforce each other and become a stronger signal that we can detect. Rest is all random. It just scatters and you don't detect it. So that's, that's what is the diffracted beam. So why crystals? Crystal is something, it's a very ordered thing, exactly repeating itself in certain way. So just like a three-dimensional grating, some of you may have seen, you can take a glass slide and draw lines, thin lines, very close to each other, and you look at the sun, you will see a diffraction pattern, or the light will be scattered, right? So same thing happens in a crystal. You can imagine that in a very tiny, very small level. So there are, we'll look at why it happens like that. So those crystals in there, when the right wavelength is given to it, it will scatter that. And that's why we can do that. So another reason why we use x-rays is because the intermolecular separations, interatomic separations, are in the range of about half an angstrom or probably 0.7 angstrom on the other end to about three angstroms. So to be able to see that particular size, we need to have a radiation of comparable size. We can't use visible light. Visible light is too long for that. So we need a very short wavelength light, and that's where X-ray fits right in there. So X-ray wavelength is somewhere around 0.1 to about five angstrom. That, that's the um, part of the uh, radiation spectrum, which is the X-ray part. And that fits very well. That's why we can use X-ray to be able to take the photograph of molecules. So then, okay, so X-ray is being scattered. Then how do we know which atom is what? Because X-rays are scattered by electrons, the number of electrons present in an atom or a molecule, that's, that decides whether it's going to be a big scattering, hydrogen is going to be a puny little scatterer because there's only one electron in it. And under most conditions, because we are not looking at hydrogen atom, it's bonded to something else. That's why that electron is not even in the full control of that. It's somewhere in between, hanging in, in between the other atom and this, forming the bond. So that's why it's almost an empty core that we are trying to you know, get a, ref a diffraction from. So that's why X-ray doesn't look at hydrogen or find hydrogen as well as others, other atoms. But that's, so X-ray scattering is dependent on how 
many electrons are scattering in phase. So what is crystal structure determination? It's what we record is the intensity and position of the diffracted beam. And we'll take that information and do some mathematical mumbo jumbo to be able to recreate where these atoms must be sitting to be able to produce the scattering that we see. And that's your three-dimensional picture. Okay. So before we do some go further, before we know why crystals are important to do doing what this is, let's look at the uh, scope, scope of the project. We want to do a structure determination. Forget about what we told you already. Now let's think about how we can do it. So let's do a quick calculation. All the all of you who have taken the first course in chemistry know how many atoms or pieces are present in one molecular weight. Okay. So let's think about, so diamond is a single crystal. Any of you wearing a diamond, that's a single crystal. We don't need a, that large a crystal. So if we have about 0 0.06 grams of a three-dimensional, I mean, of a uh, piece of diamond, we can do the structure. So 0 0.06 grams, which is about 0.3 carats. I'm not that rich, so I can't give my wife more than about a third of a carat diamond. So that's about most, most of us ordinary people can do. So let's think about a 0.3 carat, not a 3 carat diamond, 0.3 carat diamond. So 0.3 carat diamond is about 0 0.06 grams. So let's do the calculation, okay? Carbon is, uh, diamond is simply a carbon allotrope. So it's same atomic number and same molecular weight. So if we do the calculation, sorry, that's, that should have been uh, 12 grams, not six grams. So, uh, but let's do the calculation with 0 0.06 grams, so it will be half, but that probably does not change a whole lot. So with the um, mole calculation and using the Avogadro's number of 6.02 times 10 to 23 atoms in a molecule, so in, in a mole, sorry, that's about, oh, what? 0.05 moles. So if you do the calculation, we have that many atoms, about six times 10 to 21 atoms. So that is six with 21 zeros in it. So let's say even if we were able to see atoms, we are going to sit down and locate six times 10 to 21 atoms piece by piece and see. Th so here is my diamond piece. Here is number one carbon, number two, number three, and all the way up to six times 10 to 21 atom. Let's say we will calculate, we'll find all those. How long will it take? Let's say you can count up to a thousand points in one hour, which is pretty big. You go in and say one, two, three, and thousand points calculating, which is a big number. But let's say you are really, you can do it. So you are doing 24 hours of calculate, you know, counting these pieces. So that's about 24,000 points per day. So that would be 760,000 per year. So at ra that rate, to count the number of pieces in that, in that particular diamond will take you how many years? Seven times 10 to 14 years. That's seven with 14 zeros on it. Tell me who will be alive at that point to be able to tell me where was that last carbon found, right? So how are we going to solve this problem? We still want to know the structure, but we, none of us have lifetime to be able to count that for one, one crystal. There's, we saw about a million structures have been done. So even all bill, seven billion people sit down and start counting, that's not enough time to do it, okay? So that's where crystals come in. Why crystals? Crystal has an arrangement of atoms and molecules in a very regular, regular pattern. So now what we can do is we can take this large, large you know, project and shrink it to something that we can handle. So think about a wallpaper or a pattern. So look at that pattern there. What do we have? We have squares, right? So we can have squares all the way up and down that wall. But now all we need to do is if we can identify one unique piece of that wall, which is that one square, so let's look at this square, right? So if we can find, figure out what's the length, breadth, and the thickness of that, that piece, now we have the unique piece. So let's take that piece and stack it. 
in x, y, and z direction. Now we have our entire pattern. So we'll apply the same principle. Somehow we'll take that crystal, which is a very organized pattern, and we want to find just that unique piece, which may have one carbon, three nitrogens, five oxygens, or whatever. But that is much easier than counting taking seven times 10 to 14 years, right? So that's why crystals are important. And I can do my living out of crystallography because thank God there are crystals. Otherwise, absolutely, I couldn't do anything and I'm going to go hungry, okay? That's where we want to introduce the topic of unit cell and repeat unit. So what, as I told you, so let's think, look at that pattern there. We have a smiley big face, a smiley small face, and a smiley medium face. We can make that picture go one mile on each direction, okay? Now, if we can find just one of the unique pieces, one small smiley face, one small medium, and one large smiley face, now we have our pattern. We simply stack it and make it a grid or a net or a three-dimensional packing and we have our entire structure solved. And to be able to do that, the piece, the unique piece that we are getting, that's a box, because it's a three-dimensional thing. And that we define as what's called big names unit cell. Unit cell has, just like any other box, will have three separate directions or lengths and three different angles between them to be able to define that box. It doesn't have to be a rectangular box or a cubic box or any particular shape box. All it requires is we have to have a box. We can stack this box some way to fill the space. So that, so when everything works, after doing all the things that I told you we did, every, all the chemists want to see is what is the structure of the molecule. And that's what you see here. This is what is a salt structure. This is what is called phenofibric acid. This is a molecule right now in use, the, chemical, the commercial name. So this is a molecule which is, this is a compound which is used to lower cholesterol when you have high cholesterol. And the commercial name for that medicine or the drug is called Trilipix. And this structure I did a long time back in about in 2005. Actually the structure was done I think in 2002 and was published in 2005. So the, you can see, so it has the carbons are the ones in the metal. There's a chlorine on one end, there are oxygens, and there is a specific pattern to it. Why we think this works for lowering the cholesterol is how it binds to the cholesterol molecule. This, is very, this has very uh, unique property. In most cases, when you have organic acids, or for that matter, any acid, acids form hydrogen bonds. So just like water is hydrogen bonded, so where you have long range interaction, but pretty strong interaction. And that's why water is a liquid, hydrogen sulfide is a gas, because of strong hydrogen bonding. So same way, all organic acids tend to form strong hydrogen bond, but they form hydrogen bond between the carboxylic acid and the carboxylic acid of a second molecule. So they kind of flip over, and you have the OH and the carbonyl oxygen, and that will flip over and the carbonyl oxygen will form hydrogen bond to the OH hydrogen, and the hydroxyl hydrogen will form a bond, hydrogen bond to the carbonyl. So that's how you form a pair or a dimer. In this case, the difference was, it did not go for the carbonyl group of the carboxylic acid, but for the carbonyl group itself, which is sitting separately, releasing that other carboxyl group, uh, the hydroxyl group to form bonding to the um, cholesterol molecule. That's why the, we, we think, we think there hasn't been any study of which needs to be done, the DFT calculations and everything, binding study, to be able to definitely say for that. But there are only, so out of about, I think, uh, about 2,300 the um, carboxylic acid structures I've looked at, of which there's only, I think, 11 which form 11 or 12, which form this unusual hydrogen binding. That's why we think it works for lowering the cholesterol. So that, that's the type of information we need, okay? So now, what I will do is I'll kind of quickly give you what, 
So if this is such a great technique, okay, why aren't we using it for everything? Okay. We don't need an NMR. We don't need to pay anybody else. Just pay me. I'll take care of you. Right? But unfortunately, nature isn't very happy with me, and they put so many things in front of me that I can't do it on a very easy basis. So, so everything I try to do, there's going to be some problem coming up. Okay. So typically, these are the problems that we see. So even though in principle it is very easy to solve a structure, it doesn't. So twinning. Nature always does not produce a single crystal. It packs it to a different couple of them or three of them together. Okay. Then I'm in big trouble. Then I don't know which crystal is scattering and what I'm recording. How much of it is coming from crystal piece one, two, or three, or the ninth one. Right? If I cannot deconvolute date, that data and say, okay, 30% of this intensity that I'm recording is coming from crystal piece one, 60% is coming from two, if I can't do that, I can't do, use that data. That's just very messed up, mingled data. So that's what one of the problems. There are other problems with difficulty in solving, the, determining crystal system and space group. So as I told you, the crystals, there are even better ways Mathematicians have done the work for us. They have come up with space groups, the group theory that Professor Singh was talking about. So in the group theory, they have come up with, and I tell you, hopefully there are no mathematicians and it's not a complaint against them. Mathematicians have too much time in their hands. So they sat down and calculated in three dimension how many ways you can arrange points, right? So. Make a guess, how many ways you can arrange points in three dimensions? You would think there's millions and millions of ways, right? If you have set of points, how many ways you can arrange? Unfortunately, no, there's only 232 different ways you can arrange points in the three-dimensional tree, thanks to mathematicians. No, my, my, now my job is reduced from millions to 232, right? And nature is helpful in some other ways. Out of those 232, only a very few number of space groups are used by nature. Nature is extremely bright and over evolution. Nature has figured out how to take small changes and make a huge difference in biological applications. That's why, you know, very few chemicals are present in us. American Chemical Society every year comes up with what is the material value of a human body. I think right now it is sitting about $68. The chemicals present in your body, we can buy for $68, right? So that's because the way nature has used chemistry very effect effectively. There is a particular reason why the eyes are here, ears are here, and there is a perfect mirror symmetry. We could have had an eye here and I want another here, ear here and ear there. Right? Because the stereochemistry is very important, the stereo way of looking at it. So the perfect symmetry helps nature to enhance the effects that we can see. And same way, the chemicals in our body are very complicated, not by chemical structure, but by the way they react. Simply by changing from one enantiomer to a different enantiomer, it could be very effective, or the other one is a big dud, does nothing. Right? So those are the problems that we face. And in, so because of that, the number of space groups, number of ways the atoms can be arranged gets reduced very much. That helps us. So then there are other problems that come in, phase transitions, polymorphs. And we have a lot of experts in chemistry department who can, who can give you a much better talk on phase transitions and polymorphs than I can. Okay. But those are other problems that we come in. So crystals with diffuse solvent scattering. So nature hates leaving empty space. Okay. When the, the nature is the best packing, packing company you can find anywhere in the universe, it will not leave any tiny space anywhere. And it will pack the best way to fill that space. So when that doesn't happen with the molecule, nature goes out and finds anything else around, oxygen, water, solvent, anything it finds and packs into it. 
because nature wants that lattice to be tightly packed and completely full. Okay. So that's good for nature, bad for me. Now I have to find those things which are sitting there and not doing any good to the chemistry part, just making my life difficult. Okay. So that's another problem. Weakly diffracting crystals. There are crystals, unfortunately, because of the nature of the material. If you have an inorganic crystal, they are extremely strongly diffracting because they are very tightly packed. You have ionic bonds, which is the strongest bond. So that's why they will diffract like crazy. But on the other end, think about a protein. Protein is basically a sponge, right? So you take that um, protein crystal and push it a little harder, there's going to be probably 300 water molecules came out of their lattice. And vice versa, you take that protein crystal and dump it into a different buffer, sol buffer solution, it would have sucked in another 20 water molecules into it, right? So because of that spongy nature, it's not as tightly held. So the atoms and molecules have a lot of flexibility. And, but that results in poor diffraction because diffraction comes from how tightly, how well packed it is, okay? So that's why all of those problems. And I have a bunch of structures that thanks to the researchers and the synthetic groups from University of Missouri St. Louis, Washington University St. Louis, St. Louis University and Webster University. So I don't do any synthesis. I couldn't do my job without the synthetic chemist. Okay. So they are the ones which made, who made the compound. I'm the one which just gave them the structure. So all the ones that we will see are um, in the next few slides. But I'll probably skip a few slides just for the time's sake. There's a lot of structures in there. And I don't want to dump a lot of x-ray structures on you and make you bored and just go to sleep will not go into the details of why tweeting and all that. Okay, so basically, because of twin structures, because of twinning, sometimes we can take a twin crystal, and if it is a macroscopic twin, we can you know, do a microsurgery and excise the piece that's twinned up. Always, it's not that lucky. A Lot of times it's tiny crystal, so we cannot do it. We do have to collect data on a twinned crystal. But then now, with the newer techniques coming up, we are able to actually split that data and be able to say, yes, this piece of the data or this part of this percentage of diffraction coming from this piece and this is from this piece. So that's where we were able to do some things. So because of what's called mirohedral twins, where because of the way the twinning happened, it will swap at a higher metric symmetry than it is and then truly it is. So something here, so because of the mirohedral symmetry, we were thinking it's actually a monoclinic space group of P21 upon N. N. But the true symmetry is actually much lower. It's a triclinic space group. And that's where we were able to actually solve and refine. And what are the um, quality parameters? What you are looking at is the refinement results or quality parameters, which were 24%, which is an unacceptable structure, became down to about 5.6%, which is a very good structure. And those are the developments that we have been able to do in the last 20 years to be able to address and get these structures, very important structures, done. Um, I'll not go into the details of that. Miro, non -miro, let's look at some other things. So I told you about space groups. So space group is something, it's a mathematical model. Nature does not say, I'm going to crystallize in such and such space group. We have defined that particular arrangement of um, points in three-dimensional space to be this. So when you have decided on a space group and you define the molecule accordingly, what happens is if you are in the wrong space group, then you start to see really poor structure quality. So what you see there is, so the size of those ellipsoids you see, the size of those balls you see, that tells you how much area I need to map, how much area I need to scan, to be able to find all the electrons in whatever that, those are chlorines, right? So if you look at the one on the left side, that's pretty badly defined. You see those which, which should have been spherical species. So as you, can, as you can see here, so these are the ones which define the quality of the um, modeling that we have done. So 
truly the electron density should be tightly packed and in an ideal case should be spherical, close to spherical or elliptical. In this case, it is starting to look more like a cigar than a sphere, right? So that means something is wrong. And what is wrong is the way we define the space group and the crystal system we assign. So by going through various different you know, ways, kind of tracing back what we could have done wrong, we, could, we were able to, able to solve with various different twin parameter and coming back to lowering the symmetry we were able to redefine the structure, where now you can see that was the chlorine definition of the chlorine, where it has a large amount of area we need to scan to be able to find the electrons, which is not correct. Now you can see here are the same chlorines, which are now reasonably spherical. I mean, there are still some differences and some problems, but we were able to get the quality good enough to be able to interpret and publish the structure. Um, again, I'm not going to spend time on solid state phase transitions and polymorphs. Polymorphs are something quite important in practical applications because there's a lot of, so say for example, your uh, particular drug tablet that you are taking, that has been formulated in a particular polymorphic form because the amount of medicine that is in there has to be available to you at a particular time or over a particular time of, uh, over a time period. Say, for example, it was the wrong polymorph which crystallized and which got into it. Now, either it could be dissolving in your system much faster, poisoning you, because that's not the rate b b body should uptake that medication, or it's not dissolving fast enough that you are not getting any effect. It's just sitting there in your bloodstream forever and ever, not dissolving. So that's why in practical application, same thing with a lot of catalysts and a lot of formulation of different things like um, paint. If the wrong polymorph was used, so it, the FDA, the drug ag the agency which approves drugs now require that all polymorphs of a new compound that's going to be used as a drug molecule must be identified and characterized and a pattern is deposited with them so that every new batch made must be matched with it. So that's why polymorphs are very important. But I'm not going to talk too much about polymorphs here, just because of the time. I'm going to skip on this. So another problem that we come across, as I told you, is the <coughs> solvent. So, so when solvent gets trapped into the lattice, sometimes it is diffused. Because you know nature finds a little place here, a little place there. It'll pu put a small piece here and another piece there. And it's very difficult to define those. So that's when the diffuse fault scattering happens. And that actually pulls down the quality of the entire structure. So now we have to be able to de redefine that diffuse scattering. Or if we cannot define that diffuse scattering, somehow we have to calculate what is the contribution of that scattering from that particular solvent molecule that we can take out from the calculated electron density and be able to say, OK, we compensated for it. Now let's do the structure or calculate the structure based on the new data that we created from the actual theoretical, or sorry, experimental data. And that's what was done here. Because of the diffuse solvent here, we theoretically pulled the structure out of the solvent out, recalculated our intensities, and was able to do a good quality structure. Um, same thing with molecules with long chains. They, those don't pack very well. That's why they end up with weakly diffracting crystals. This is one of the crystals that we had to send to a synchrotron source because we just could not do enough diffraction of it in, our, in my home lab to be able to do a structure. This is, again, an important drug molecule. So it is under patent right now, so I, don't, I can't tell you too much about it. Um, these are what I call large small molecules or small large molecules. And, the expert with these is sitting in the front row here. He can tell you a lot more about supramolecular structures than I can. Okay. So these are kind of very fluffy things. So depending on how you handle it, how it was crystallized, how it was done, there's going to be a lot of difference. And at the end, usually they don't produce a good structure, but good enough to be able to learn about. So this is a molecule which forms a hexameric capsule 
and this is right now being considered under a testing for um, drug delivery of very, so right now there is problem of overuse of antibiotics. So because of that, a lot of antibiotics are become, a lot of bacteria is becoming resistant to anti anti antibiotics. So now people are trying, retrying to go back to the old antibiotics and see if their potency can be now improved by coordinating to different things. And this is one of the ways you can do it, encapsulate it, target it, and get it to a right point. So that, that was the idea of this project from uh, Professor Gokul's group. I'm not going to go into that. So one of my passion has been discussing about uh, teaching of crystallography. Okay? So I have taught both undergraduate and graduate courses in crystallography. And I teach a crystallography course, full crystallography course uh, for PhD students every, at least every other year. So why, why are we important, why it is important, why am I fighting with this thing for so long? So because a lot of our students, and same thing here too, a lot of you will go to chemistry fields. And now in chemistry fields, the job requires you to learn and be able to interpret very high level of data. And one of the things that you will come across is crystallographic data or structural data. And I want to make sure my students learn enough. They don't have to be crystallographers tomorrow because we teach them in a kind of black box way. They are not becoming crystallographers overnight. But when they go into the literature, when they go into their lab in their workplace, if they see something about a crystal structure, they should be able to interpret it and be able to tell his or her boss, that, okay, this is a structure we can believe in. Is it a good quality structure? Can we depend on it? Can we take that data and be able to use and go to the next step, whether it is a synthetic one, cat catalyst one, or whatever? So that's why we have been trying to use crystallography, introducing crystallography from very early on, rather than wait for them to go to a PhD level chemistry course to be able to uh, <coughs> learn that. So. Again, I'm not going to focus too much on graduate student crystallography. Everybody, I think here also, you must have crystallography courses at graduate level. So that's where it's fine. Most people learn that. And so, but unfortunately, that's a very limited audience. Only people who do PhD will be able to do that, um, will be able to learn about that technique, be able to learn about what the data tells you. So we teach a course, a three credit course, every other year, and what happens is every student does a crystal structure of their own independently. This is a new compound. Either they make it from their own research or we provide them a new crystal, but they must do the complete structure solution and refinement and submit a, provide a submission ready paper that they will present to the faculty and to the class and also be ready to submit to the ACTA crystallography gap for publication. That's, that's what they, they get their grade. They don't do that, they can't pass the course. So why crystallography in undergraduate labs? And I already told you why. That's what the job requires nowadays. We cannot simply ignore that fact that we do not want to worry about advanced techniques in undergraduate labs. So that's why we try to introduce this. So University of Missouri St. Louis was one of the first few lab universities to introduce crystallography in undergraduate labs. So I'll give you a couple of experiments here. So one is a pretty um, simple experiment that talks about polymorphs. Again, I told you the reason why polymorphs are important. And this does not require any real crystallography uh, instrumentation. We simply tell them that this is, so sulfathiazole is an antibiotic and it produces thousands of different crystal forms, polymorphs. Polymorphs, pseudopolymorphs, and all that. So, but primarily it forms about four different types of crystals under certain different uh, solvents. So in our labs, what we do is we simply buy the chemical, we don't make that, and we tell the students that they can crystallize from these, these, these solvents, water, ethanol, acetone, and few other. And it, so this is a experiment that's based on the student's input. So when they crystallize, they look at their crystals and say, 
hmm, your crystal looks like needles. Mine is plates. You must have decomposed it. You did something. I did it right. Okay. All right. So then we come in and give them a lecture about Waller polymorphs. And we tell them that no, nobody screwed up anything. All of those are still the same compound that you started with. Okay. Then there is a published paper in uh, Jacob Sock, which shows the picture of four commonly formed crystal forms, the four polymorphs. And we give them that picture. They go under a microscope and see and visually identify which one of the forms they have made. Unfortunately, also, this is a very ideal system, right? I mean, every time the form three doesn't look like form three. So visually, they have identified, because we have access to the instruments, what we do is we do a cell determination, which is the gold standard to be able to identify a polymorph. Then they match what they had decided based on the <coughs> visual identification, whether they were right or wrong. And that's what we tell them also. It is a good starting point, but that's not the ultimate answer. So that's one of the experiments we do. So um, I'll probably skip this one. So the other experiment we do is a multi-step synthesis followed by a crystallography. The reason, so this is a condensation of citral with malonic acid, okay? And the product formed here, so initially they know enough theory to be able to predict what the structure should come out of that, that reaction. Unfortunately, it forms a multi-fuse -system, multi system, multi fused structure that they don't have enough theory to be able to predict. And the NMR is pretty flat. The proton NMR does not tell the difference. But it, the lucky part is it forms very beautiful, very easy crystals. So we tell them to produce the crystals and then we walk them through the process of mounting and crystal and collecting data. We probably don't collect data on every one of them because we probably now have 200 different data sets collected over years. So, but they go through the process of actually mounting and looking at and seeing how the crystal structure data collection is done. Then the next student comes and we just give them one of the stored data sets. And at the end, when, so they, they sit in a computer lab. I'm on the instructor lab, um, an instructor seat, and we walk them through the public domain software to be able to solve and see the structure. Obviously, this is a four or five hour lab period that they are learning. So it's, I'm not going to say everybody learned enough crystallography, but their eyes literally light up when they see the structure coming out of their you know, computer. And then they quickly figure, oh, that's why I was seeing that es ester group, but I couldn't figure out where to put it, right? So that's why this is a very interesting experiment. And now, because the senior students have told their juniors that there is a fun lab coming up, and we tell them not to tell the structure, because we have been using that compound for 15 years now. So, <laughs> but that, that's a very you know, interesting experiment that students have learned, and they really love that. So, um, why we call it an ideal organic um, crystallography experiment? Uh, during the reaction, a fused ring, ring system is produced, which is difficult to characterize and predict at least at this level of experiment carried out. This compound is hard to characterize by NMR because the proton NMR is featureless and flat. So forms good quality crystals, the experiment involves reproducible multi-step synthesis. So we have produced a you know, experimental detail that reasonably makes pretty easy synthesis, multi-step synthesis, and forms the correct product. And at the end, the 3D structure pops up. Their students are very excited to see that. And in the process, they have learned something that otherwise they wouldn't have been exposed to. And this was presented as an invited lecture in that symposium in 2011 ACA meeting in New Orleans. So then, so same students first take the organic lab, then they will go on to the advanced inner lab the following semester. So now we expect them, they have learned enough that they can choose crystals, they can mount their crystals. So now they are doing an experiment, which is a synthesis of uh, metal tosylates. So 
in this case, the fun is, so they are working under inert atmosphere. So this is the first time they are working with, uh, you know, dry, dry boxes, um, the globe boxes and other, you know, air free atmosphere. And most of the times, they will screw it up. We know that. And that's what we want to also tell them, that how they can, you know, inert atmosphere things may go bad. So after the synthesis, they will have to, they will do the synthesis and they will crystallize. So during some, anywhere in the process, if they have exposed to even limited amount of water, all the ligands will be replaced by water. So the number of DMFs left on the crystal structure still tells you how badly they exposed the, <laughs> the during the synthesis or crystallization. And they figured that out pretty quick. So in the process, so usually we use manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel um, uh, tosylates to be synthesized. So. In the inorganic lab, we go through a four hour lab period and um, we can use either CellXTL or OLEX. OLEX software is a public domain software. Everybody here uses that. And at the end, students prepare a lab report, which is in the JCAM, uh, JCAM SOC communication template. And they explain you know, why the structure became what it was or why it did not happen what they were expecting. So that's one of the structures. So in this case, we still have all the four DMFs. So obviously I did that structure, I didn't screw it up. I could keep all the DMFs there. So if not, we have had all the way up to hexa aqua compounds from the students because not only they replaced even the, the DMFs, they also replaced the tosylates as well <laughs> with enough exposure. So, this time, I would like to thank my co-collaborators uh, from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, Washington University, St. Louis University, Webster University, and from time to time, other academic institutions that I have collaborated over 32 years at uh, St. Louis. So, and thank you all, and funding from National Science Foundation, Missouri Research Board, and Missouri Research Board is kindly acknowledged here. We couldn't have done my work without somebody paying for it. So thank you very much for your attention. Things like electrochemical systems that we use, the cost has come down drastically. Yes. From a couple of lakhs, now it has come down to a couple of thousands. Yeah. NMR also has come down drastically again, as I put it. But our uh, XRD somehow is retaining same old. What is the reason? Why can't we bring it down? It has come down. Has but you know the detector has changed. If we still want to buy a you know a point detector system, it will be pretty cheap. We don't want that crystal that system anymore. Mm -hmm. Since you know we are but going basic for things are have come down, right? Yeah. Because Quite if, a bit. if uh, we have enough XRDs in our uh, labs, in our SIF or instrumentation center, probably we can introduce some undergraduate experiments yes. for these students. So it will become. The study will become very interesting. We only teach them theory. It was a wonderful lecture. And I'm sure that actually our students uh, suddenly now more oriented or curious and interested basically to take uh, the crystallography as, uh, they, as their career option. Uh, suddenly his lecture must have uh, created the curiosity in uh, others too, not only the students, not only our chemistry students because uh, he talked uh, mostly about you know, w the importance of crystallography in the uh, crystallography uh, in day to day life uh, he talked about the uh, you know how the drugs and the, I mean, the polymorphism in drugs uh, that is actually useful in delivering the drug and uh, the most interesting part to me as a teacher is uh, the teaching crystallography to our undergrad students and even Professor Gurmit um, Singh, our Vice Chancellor, was also asking me that whether we have that uh, uh, in theory. Yes, we do have. And, uh, but uh, we, uh, of course, we have only one spectrophotometer, X ray spectrophotometer. Otherwise, no, we would have given the chance to our uh, undergrad students also to have the hands-on experience and now on behalf of 
our vice chancellor professor rat on behalf of our vice chancellor and uh, the directors uh, professor tarani karsu and professor jain i would like to on on the behalf on behalf of my colleagues and our students i would like to thank you for being with us and giving a great presentation <laughs> and as a matter of fact i asked him actually now you have the retirement life and then how are you spending your time and he laughed and said that i have plenty of papers to write and then writing and writing and writing in spite of his busy schedule and then writing paper you know uh, it kills a lot of time and in spite of his busy schedule and he's with us and uh, and i took him the uh, tour of the university and then he really liked this place and i'm very happy that he's here on behalf of all the audience i also would like to thank uh, professor tarani karsu and our vice chancellor for inviting professor rat here and and making us to uh, listen to your great lecture and thank you very much thank you all